Lambda or EC2? This is a very common question asked during design discussion. This is also a hot topic in interviews. So in this video, we are going to go over the differences between EC2 and Lambda, look at some use cases. Also, we are going to discuss some of the alternatives of using EC2. Hi guys and girls, Raj here, your friendly neighborhood cloud architect. All right, let's jump into the video. All right, let's start from beginning. So what is serverless? Serverless has these four properties. No servers to provision or manage, either physical or virtual. It automatically scales with usage. You do not have to define an auto-scaling group, auto-scaling policy, etc. If the traffic goes up, it will scale up. When the traffic goes down, it will scale down. You pay for what you use. You never pay for idle. And lastly, it is inherently highly available. In the backend, it's automatically deployed in more than one availability zone. So what are some of the serverless services? Uh, so folks have this misconception that a Lambda is the only serverless service, which is not true. So any AWS service which satisfies these four criteria is actually part of the serverless ecosystem. So what are some of these services? We have Amazon DynamoDB, API Gateway, AWS Step Functions, and Amazon SQS, and there are many more. However, for this video, we are going to talk about the crown jewel of serverless, which is AWS Lambda. AWS Lambda is a compute service that lets you run code without provisioning or managing servers. Now, let's take a look at what is EC2. So EC2s are servers in AWS provisioned with few clicks and within few minutes. It supports variety of operating systems, and EC2 is actually backbone of multiple AWS services, such as Amazon Elastic Container Service, Amazon Elastic Container Service for Kubernetes, uh, also known as EKS, Amazon RDS, and there are many more. However, for this video, we are going to talk about vanilla Amazon EC2. All right, now that we understand what is Lambda and what is EC2, let's take a look at environment difference between these two. So for Lambda, underlying infrastructure is managed by AWS. So it scales automatically, and since you don't manage any server, you don't have to patch anything. For EC2, you control the underlying infrastructure, such as VM size, operating system, AMI, etc. However, what that means is you need to handle the scalability. If you want your EC2s to be scalable, you need to set up the auto-scaling group, auto-scaling policy, etc. And beyond that, since you are managing the server, you have to patch it, you have to do the AMI rehydration, etc. So this requires some management and orchestration. So Lambda has significantly less maintenance overhead in this area. Since you don't have access to any server with Lambda, you cannot install any software such as web server, app server in the underlying environment. However, you can install code libraries. Whatever code library your Lambda code is using, you can install, you can zip them all up, and then you can deploy them with your Lambda. So EC2 shine in this area. Since it's a server, you can install almost any software. And there are a lot of prepackaged AMIs with different softwares already available. For Lambda, there is an easy selection of compute power. Uh, let's say you have a Lambda running, and then at any point you want to go change your Lambda, all you have to do is go change the slider bar for memory and timeout, and they will be changed. You can change the memory from 128 megabyte to three gigabyte, and timeout from one second to 15 minutes. And as you increase the allocated memory to the Lambda, under the hood, Lambda will allocate more CPU to it as well. EC2, you can select different EC2 size and types. As you change the size and type of a running EC2 instance, it might briefly be interrupted. For Lambda, there is no attached hard disks or EBS, and the deployment packet size is limited. You can attach one or multiple hard disks or EBS to EC2. So you can pretty much deploy any package of any size. Lambda is inherently highly available. So under the hood, 
it deploys the Lambda into multiple availability zone. So even if one AZ goes down, your Lambda will be still up and running. For EC2, user need to establish high availability. So if you want your EC2 to be highly available, you have to deploy the same EC2 in two different AZs and then create a load balancer and all that stuff. So what is one of the superpower of Lambda? Since you don't have to manage any server, and it's inherently scalable and highly available, it is much easier to onboard into Lambda. And you can focus on solving the business problem rather than doing the maintenance and orchestration. And what is one of the superpowers of EC2? You have complete control of environment. And it is a rich ecosystem of different AMIs with different prepackaged software. You can literally run anything on EC2. Okay, now let's take a closer look at use case differences between Lambda and EC2. So Lambda shines at event-driven architectures. It has native integration with other services. Let's say anytime you put an object in an S3 bucket, you want to process something. So you can trigger Lambda from that S3 bucket directly. For EC2, it enables faster migration to cloud with other softwares. Let's say you want to run a web server, an app server, uh, with some other third-party software, you can install all of that in an EC2. Lambda is suited when traffic is unpredictable. Why? Because it scales automatically and you pay as you go. EC2's best cost case is when traffic is predictable. Because you pay for the underlying virtual machine regardless, and when it scales, it scales an entire VM. So we are going to take a look at this in detail in the next slide. Serverless is good to implement microservices because Lambda has API gateway integration. Uh, the code is modular without software dependencies, for example, Python APIs, and it is easier to migrate cloud native Greenfields apps to serverless. EC2 is good for microservices as well because it is easy to move API with dependencies, for example, Spring Boot, uh, however, you have to consider cost and complexity for greenfield applications. So in the last slide, we went through a couple superpowers. So what is a kryptonite for Lambda? For brownfield monoliths to Lambda, major refactoring might be needed. For EC2, the kryptonite is more day to operational overhead than serverless. And also there is a generally underutilized CPU memory leading to cost waste. So now let's take a look at scaling of Lambda versus container. So for Lambda, as traffic increases, Lambda will scale itself automatically. And the great part is you only pay for what you use. Let's say your Lambda ran 1000 times a month. So you only pay for that 1000 times. If next month, the same Lambda ran 100 times, then you only have to pay for that 100 times. So now let's take a look at the scaling of EC2. Uh, generally, in production, you have Elastic Load Balancer pointing to an auto-scaling group, and inside that auto-scaling group, there is an EC2 running. Now, let's say we have a traffic coming and hitting that Elastic Load Balancer. And let's assume this brings the CPU of EC2 to 50%, as marked by this half green box inside that EC2. Then let's say the traffic increased, so then the CPU increased to 100% for that EC2. Traffic keeps increasing, it is gonna spin up another EC2, and in that EC2, the CPU used will be 50%. But take a note, even though the second EC2 at 50% utilization, you have to pay for the entire EC2. So even though 50% of this EC2 is idle, it doesn't matter, you are charged for the entire EC2. Wait before you make up your mind. Let's take a look at a couple use cases in the next slide. So let's say one of your Lambda is running 3 million times a month and the Lambda has 512 megabyte of memory and each execution lasts around 300 millisecond and the traffic is unpredictable. So using the Lambda cost calculator, you are going to pay $8 per month for this Lambda. Now the same traffic, uh, to accommodate this, you need a T3 small and you need two of them to make it highly available. So you're gonna pay around $29 per month. 
Uh, however, remember that our traffic is unpredictable, so cost will increase during higher spike because of scaling. Because the entire VM will scale and you have to pay for that entire EC2, doesn't matter how much CPU is being utilized. Now let's look at another scenario. Let's say now the traffic is 90 million per month. The memory 512 megabyte, uh, each execution is 250 millisecond. Traffic is predictable. So in that case, uh, Lambda, you're gonna pay $206 a month. Uh, for EC2, so this traffic can be accommodated using a T3 medium, and you need uh, two of those to make it HA, you're only gonna pay $58 per month. So what is the big difference here? Uh, because of predictable traffic, it makes it possible to select proper VM and higher CPU utilization. So in this case, if the traffic is steady, the EC2 don't need to scale. You can keep these two T3 mediums and it's gonna process all the traffic and the CPU will probably in the high end, which is good because you don't want to pay for idle resources with EC2 and that's why the cost is lower. So the conclusion is one is not cheaper or pricier than the other. It all depends on the use case. So now that we know the differences between Lambda and EC2, uh, let's take a look at some of the other EC2 alternatives. Also, if you're liking the content, please feel free to smash that like button and click subscribe. That helps this channel a lot and that kind of motivates me to uh, make more videos. All right, let's look into the alternatives now. Uh, so let's say you have a microservice uh, running on EC2. Alternative is you move that code to Lambda and use API Gateway for the API. A web server running on EC2. Um, so you can do website hosting using S3 and you can use Lambda API Gateway for the dynamic content. Uh, databases on EC2, uh, you should always uh, migrate to cloud native service when you can. Uh, so you should migrate to Amazon RDS and Amazon Aurora. Uh, especially if you are running something like Oracle on EC2, uh, you should look into migrating to Amazon Aurora which provides the security, availability, and reliability of commercial databases at one-tenth the cost. And NoSQL databases running on EC2, uh, you should uh, think about migrating to DynamoDB or Manage Cassandra. All right, so next one, self-manage Kubernetes cluster on EC2. You should look into migrating to EKS, Fargate, or even ECS. Running a bunch of machine learning stuff on EC2, uh, you should look into SageMaker. Uh, in your project or in an interview, this comes up, mention this, and I guarantee you, uh, your team members or the interviewer will be impressed. So what are my parting words? Uh, so we started this video with Lambda versus EC2, because we love to compare in this current world. Uh, however, as we saw, in some use cases, uh, Lambda is more suitable, and in some other use cases, EC2 is more suitable. So always do your own analysis. So you pick and choose between Lambda and EC2 based on your use case, traffic pattern, performance, cost analysis, etc. So it's not really serverless versus EC2, it's more like serverless and EC2. All right, guys and girls, that is the video. Hopefully this video was useful. I'll see you guys and girls in the next video. Bye.